Well, hello everyone. We are here in Medanta Hospital along with Dr. Ruchita Sharma, who has very kindly given us her time to share information about the coronavirus and about this second wave. We're extremely grateful to you, Dr. Ruchita, because we know that you've been on the front lines, uh, working extremely hard day and night, very busy these days, dealing with the massive influx of patients. Uh, but we're so grateful to you because it's vitally important that the real information gets out to the public. We've been hearing so much misinformation and false news. Uh, and so we need to hear from you know, a qualified, respected doctor such as yourself. And we're very grateful to you for giving your time. Thank you so much for giving me opportunity. And I'll try my best to give all the answers. And I will try my best to help people and not to listen the myths, but the facts. Thank you very, very much. So we'll be doing myth busting today. So uh, I think a lot of people have been talking about this second wave being worse than the first wave possibly more virulent, possibly causing more deaths. Uh, so could you uh, let us know the real information about the second wave and is it worse than the first wave? Yes, I would say it is worse than the first wave. In the first wave, we got so much time for uh, getting prepared for a patient, receiving patient. We had beds and everything. This time, we just couldn't understand what is happening. It was really rapid and I must say it is actually uh, dangerous. It is involving more younger people, though data says 30, last time the younger population were like 31%, this time 32%. But what we are seeing is actually, yes, it is involving more younger people who did not had any chronic illnesses. Like last time they were saying the patient who are having diabetes and hypertension, they are having more chronic, more dangerous disease. But this time, even younger people are involving, so it is definitely more dangerous. Okay, that's interesting and important for the listeners to know. And so with the second wave, would you say that there are new symptoms as compared to the first wave? Yes, sir. definitely. We are seeing few uh, new symptoms this time, more of abdominal symptom. Last time it was, by and large, it was just a cough, fever, breathlessness. Now this time they are having more of abdominal symptoms like uh, vomiting, diarrhea, loose motion. Even with the, at the peak disease when, the, the, when there is, should be breathlessness, the patients are having more symptom of vomiting and feeling weak and uh, rashes also I have seen. I have seen few patients with the features of like myocardial infarction. They are having features of cardiac failure, bradycardia, pulse rate are getting high. So they are coming with different, different symptoms this time. Mm, okay, so that's also important for people to know that a lot of these things could be symptoms of COVID. So would you say people ought to get checked if they're experiencing these things? Yes, if you have come in contact with the, any person who had COVID, uh, you should always check for temperature, pulse rate, blood pressure and oxygen. Of course, SpO2 is important, but other parameters are equally important. If you're having vomiting, just take a lot of fluid so that you don't get dehydration. And if you're having loose motion, a lot of pain, abdomen, sometimes it may be the, you know, it may match the flare disease. Uh, it may match the peak of the disease. So you should be very careful. Right. This is really important because I think everyone's checking the temperature, but not the oxygen rate and the blood pressure. Yeah. Even the respiratory rate. If you're feeling that your, your feeling is very important. If you're feeling I'm not feeling okay, that is very important. The kind of breathlessness, because it sometimes it is not matching. Sometimes patients are coming with the feeling of breathlessness before they are getting lower SPO2. Mm. So that feeling of breathlessness is very important. If you are feeling uncomfortable, just discuss this with your doctor. Right. That is very important. Thank you very much. And could you tell us more about how the disease spreads? And crucially, this question of is it airborne? Yeah. There were a lot of discussion over this topic. I would say uh, after reading or articles, after giving after this uh, article which came in Lancet few months ago that it is basically airborne. So there was a lot of question, but finally WHO, WHO has also, also accepted that it is basically airborne and they have given few 10 questionnaire, 10 reasons why it is airborne mm -hmm. and finalized also it that it is basically airborne. And the difference between airborne and aerosol, you know, the airborne, it stays in uh, air for longer time. So once you know that it is airborne, so what the parent or the other people should know, understand this, that if it is airborne, putting mask is the most important thing. Mm. 
So Ra rather than cleaning surface, okay, fine. That is also equally important. But if you know that it is airborne, basically, just put mask wherever. If you are going out, you should have mask on your face. That mm -hmm. is the most important thing. So it means you should wear mask not only if you're talking to people, but anytime you're Any out. Day. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this information, as you just shared with us, mm -hmm. uh, is in the Lancet, which is topmost uh, medical journal mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. and the WHO, the World Health Organization, which is the most credible mm -hmm source of information. So that's extremely important. Thank you very much. Um, now, I think people want to know when they should go to get their COVID test done. You know, first, should they go at all? And if they have to go, when should they go? There are two kind of population. Uh, one population, I would say, who are having symptoms. Like if anyone is having symptoms, say fever, he should get tested that day itself. He should not wait for the symptom. And the reason behind it, he should not spread the infection. So he should get himself tested on day one only. The other population who are exposed, like the family, near family members, they should get tested on that day. They are positive, they should isolate. If they are negative, then in that case, they should wait for five to seven days. And again, they should be tested, then only they should come out. At the onset of symptom, the patient should get tested. Right, okay. So this is crucial because a lot of people are waiting a long time before they get tested. And there were one more, there was one more question that uh, what test should I undergo? If the facility is there, RT-PCR is confirmatory. Mm -hmm. If it is not there, even antigen is very important. COVID antigen, if it is positive, it means patient is having COVID. Mm -hmm. If it is negative, it may be, you know, false negative. But once it is positive, it is 100% COVID. Could you tell us a little more about the accuracy of the RT-PCR test? Yeah. COVID RT-PCR is 70% sensitive and 95% specific. So uh, once it is positive, it's most likely positive. Mm -hmm. RT-PCR is very sensitive and uh, there was also a question that if the, the virus is mutating, the RT-PCR may be negative. But actually you see the what RT-PCR does, actually it sees the genes. So if there is a change in genes also, they see at least two, three genes. Mm -hmm. So there are high probability of uh, getting itself uh, tested, uh, checked by the RT-PCR. And with the antigen, COVID antigen, it uh, sees the capsule of the virus. So if it is positive, it is 100% COVID positive. Right. So there are no false positives. There's no false positive. Okay. That's very crucial information again. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we want to know how is COVID-19 affecting children and are there different symptoms in children? Are there any symptoms in children and what sort of precautions should children be taking? In kids, mostly uh, I would say around 20% kids are asymptomatic. They are not having any symptom. And then again, large population, maybe 60% or so are having very minor symptom and they are mostly abdominal. They are having cramps, they are having headache, they are having vomiting, they are having diarrhea, and sometimes they are having flu-like symptoms too, but mostly they are having headache and fever sometimes. So because of the multi-inflammatory syndrome, that is actually, it happens weeks after the onset of the symptom. Like the, if the pa uh, kid is exposed today, they, are, they may be having, they, uh, they don't have much symptoms, but after a few weeks, they might develop the you know, a lot of symptoms like breathlessness mm -hmm. and all, there are chances. So the parents should be very careful okay. even after weeks. If there's any history of exposure or COVID positivity in children, the parents should be, uh, you know, watchful for mm -hmm. any onset of symptom like breathlessness, fever, fatigue, myalgia. After three, four weeks, they should immediately contact to the doctor. Right. This is very important because there's a myth that children are not affected. Mm -hmm. Right. And there are certain risk factors also. Like in kids, if the baby is very small, less than one year, or the kid is having diabetes, hypertension, any uh, medication for any um, rheumatological disorder, immunosuppressants or uh, diabetes, I said, yes, heart disease, I said. And uh, yeah, these are the conditions where there, there are more chances of, you know, um, uh, they are high risk for mm -hmm. severe disease. Okay, so children with comorbidities are at higher risk. They have given this list and the most, uh, you know, uh, around 10 to 12 years kids are comparatively safer. Mm. Okay. And uh, there are various myths and questions around vaccination for children. Of course, as we know, as of now, vaccination is only available for 18 plus. 
Uh, but people would like to know, is there some kind of vaccination for children in future? Should children get vaccinated? Definitely, and there are trials going on. And once it is in the market, I would recommend that everybody should go undergo vaccination. Mm. Everybody should go okay. for vaccination. Right. Yeah. So it is under myth, trial yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. That children should not get vaccinated. This myth is there. Actually, yeah. they should get vaccinated. They should get vaccinated. It is. It, if you think, you know, just, just see the flu. We are getting our kids vaccinated every year. So similarly, maybe, you know, from next year, 2022 or onwards, maybe we will have our, we will have vaccine and uh, we'll get this vaccination program every year for kids also. Mm, okay. Yeah. And on the question of vaccination, could you tell us, are there any risks associated with taking the vaccine? There is no risk associated with taking vaccine. It is very safe. We have taken um, as a healthcare provider, we took it on, at the onset of the disease only when it, in, in very initial days, I would say. So there is no risk. There is no risk. It is very safe. Because mm. a lot of people have a fear about taking the vaccine and there are a lot of myths about it. I, I would request vaccine. everyone to undergo for vaccination and uh, there, should, there should not be any fear. It is very safe. Mm. Good. I think this is very important for everyone to hear and we will all be protected. I haven't yeah. seen a single, you know, I'm, uh, my hospital is big. We have seen so many staff. We have this active vaccination program. I've not seen a single patient who's having problem. Maybe some, you know, fever, maybe a myalgia may be there for a day. Mm. And that goes with paracetamol. Right. Not more than that. Just a one day side effect. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, after taking your first dose of the vaccine, how long should you wait before taking the second dose? That is very important. Last time uh, the government gave the guideline of four weeks difference, but now they are saying the for development of proper immunity, they say around you should wait for six weeks, six to eight weeks they should. Six to eight weeks. To eight. So this is revised guidance after the four week guidance. So now it's six to eight weeks. For uh, development of uh, better immunity. Right. If after taking your first dose, you contract COVID in between, you test positive in between. Should that change your schedule of taking the second yeah. dose? Yeah, this is very important to know. That once you have COVID infection and you are scheduled for vaccination, you should wait for one month. Mm. Four weeks uh, should be the waiting period before the second dose of the vaccine. Four weeks after recovering from yes. COVID. After taking the second uh, dose of COVID shield, we have around 70 to 80% uh, immunity. And for Covaxin also, we have 78% immunity. But that is two weeks after the second dose. Okay, so two weeks after the second yes. dose. We'll have to wait for two weeks at least for developing the full immunity. And they say afterwards, you this immunity is, you know, it goes on, it increases. And so after getting both doses and waiting two weeks, mm -hmm. should you still take precautions? Yeah. The precaution should be there because it is still 70 to 80 percent. Mm. So those 20 percent are there. Okay. Yeah. Now, are there any side effects of COVID that continue long term after getting COVID? Any long term symptoms? Yeah, yeah it is effect? there. It is there. Uh, we call it as a post COVID sequelae. Whenever you contract the illness, initial first week is the safest period. So from day 7 to day 14 is the critical time when the patient can have this flared symptom. It is not 100% that everybody will have this flared symptom, but around 20 to 30% population do have this flared symptom at the peak of the day, day 12 or day 14. Afterwards, the, the problem, you know, is better, the patient feels better and there is less problem. But again, in few patients, there are again uh, recurrence of the symptom. Sometimes the patient are having prolonged fever. Sometimes the patient are having myalgia. Sometimes the patients are having again the recurrence of breathlessness at day 20 or day 30. So once the anyone is having COVID, I'm not scaring anyone. But one should know the symptom may reoccur or the chances of breathlessness may be there even after 20 days. Mm. Even with the second wave, we are seeing it more. Right. And so is there something people should do to manage that particularly? Yeah. Since we know most of the investigation now, and we know it is a basically a coagulation problem, which is happening at the later day. So if you're having CRP and D-dimer, um, these are the lab investigations. And if it is deranged initially also, so they should be in constant touch with the 
consultant okay. physician so basically and they should the doctor. yeah okay. number one number two they should be watchful for spo2 oxygen and uh, pulse rate and blood pressure right, right. yeah okay. or fever yes so constant medical vigilance is important so what are some of the common myths about covid and about diets related to covid mm -hmm. and about cures for covid Okay, so I remember a few myths uh, which are uh, funny also. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> people think that uh, drinking alcohol will kill COVID, but it is not. There is no reason to take alcohol. And then second, spraying alcohol f over kids. So they think they are killing COVID, but actually you are just spoiling the skin, so avoid it. Then uh, too much, you know, I have seen people taking, okay, I understand healthy milk is good. But taking just once or twice. I have seen people having gastritis, severe gastritis because of taking so much haldi and milk. So you should uh, avoid it. Doing gargle is fine. But just thinking that if I will drink warm water, you know, very hot water, the COVID will not, uh, you will not get infected with the COVID. That is not true. Mm -hmm. Warm water is soothing. It is fine. Mm -hmm. But, you know, drinking very hot water will not kill this virus as we know. Uh, the climate change is not, uh, there is no difference with the climate change. This is also a myth that patient, um, we were, we used to think, even everybody used to think that uh, in the cold climate, there will not be COVID, but there is no difference of temperature to this virus. So these are some uh, common myth that. Mm. So hot water is a, a temporary soothing, but it's not a cure. No, not a cure. Yeah. Even healthy milk is not a cure. Drinking alcohol is not a cure. Spraying alcohol is not a cure. Is there anything that you should or should not eat when you have got COVID? Yes, uh, we should be hydrated. That is the most important thing. Vitamin C, naturally or tablet form, anything would be very helpful. So eating more oranges, maybe um, oranges are good. Lemon water is good and a uh, lot of fruit because then you are more hydrated also and uh, you have vitamins. So that is good. Even taking haldi is definitely is good. There is in India, there is a lot of talk about giloy. So I don't have any scientific reason, but if you are feeling fine with the giloy, it is okay. This is just a juice, you can have it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is it true that certain foods boost your immunity? Yeah, that is true. As I told you, vitamin C, that is one immunity booster. Taking amla and oranges, lemon, and all the fresh fruits, lot of drink uh, in any form, plain water, soup, juices, milk, uh, curd is always helpful. One myth is al always there in India, if you are having cough, you cannot take curd. So there is nothing to do with curd, you can have curd. In fact, in COVID protocol, what we are following, we are, uh, we are giving antibiotic to everyone. So if you're taking curd with that, it is very helpful for stomach and it acts as a probiotic basically, so it's good. And you can take rice again. In India, there is a lot of question about if I'm having cough, I cannot have curd, I cannot have rice. Yes, you can have both of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of people are asking about medicine for treatment of COVID. So are there any medicines that you would or would not recommend for the treatment of COVID? Yes, definitely. First, I would like to uh, say about what you should take. So what uh, we are following is also our uh, government protocol that giving azithromycin or doxycycline as an antibiotic and vitamin C and zinc COVID as a booster, immunobooster and ivermectin uh, for three to five days for all COVID patient you must take. Now the question comes for steroid. I would uh, highly discourage anyone taking a steroid for initial first week when that is the phase when the virus is replicating and if you are taking a steroid during that phase actually you are increasing the virus replication so you should 100% you should avoid taking uh, um, any steroid during this phase yes you may require steroid but let the doctor only the who are who are qualified let him decide in India, what I am saying, because you know, I I I am agreeing that there were no bed initially when we had this lot of load of COVID, but now we have beds, and now we are treating patient. But taking a steroid at home 
is uh, that two injection tablet is fine if you are having breathlessness you are having patches in the ct so if you are uh, told by your doctor that you should take steroid it is fine mm. but i highly i don't want anybody to take injectable steroid at home right so don't take it until and unless a qualified doctor has prescribed yes. for you yes. right and the second thing remdesivir mm. So, you know, because it is so much in the media, remdesivir, remdesivir, so everybody thinks if remdesivir is a main treatment. Remdesivir is not uh, recommended for everybody. It is recommended only for those who, be, who is having moderate to severe illnesses. So what criteria we are following? If the, if the patient is sick enough to have pneumonia, moderate pneumonia, COVID pneumonia, and who requires oxygen, then only we start remdesivir. We generally start only to the patient who are, who are going to, you know, develop hypoxia. Mm. Without hypoxia means low oxygen, we don't prescribe remdesivir. Right. It will not be any of use. There, I'm seeing people, they are behind us, give us remdesivir. Why should we give? You know, if there is a benefit, there is harm also. Mm. Remdesivir can cause, you know, the kidney problem. If the creatinine rises, the remdesivir can uh, get kidneys, uh, kidney function tests worsen. Mm. So one should uh, avoid giving this. Okay. So remdesivir is only indicated in few of the examples, right. not all. So remdesivir is not a magic cure for COVID. Exactly. It should only be taken if recommended by a doctor for a particular case. Exactly. Okay. And tocilizumab also. There's one drug called tocilizumab mm. and we give it only in, you know, there are few indication when the patient is in ICU and having severe illness and the, this surge of uh, C-reactive protein is high, interleukin-6 is very, very high, then only we get, you know, we give the tocilizumab. Mm. And that is only after, you know, taking decision, after seeing the patient's condition. One cannot pressurize for tocilizumab and it is not the final cure. You know, mm. the people should understand this. Good, thank you. That's really important information. Now, who should get a CT scan and when should they get it? Any patient who is having breathlessness or SpO2 is dropping down or there is persistent fever on day 11, day 12, then only it is recommended. So if uh, what is happening in India, if anyone is getting positive for COVID, that day only, that, that very that day, they get CT scan done, they get X-ray done, they get all the blood investigation done, and during that time, you know, the virus is just replicating. It has not caused any harm to your body. So everything is normal. Mm -hmm. So once the disease progresses at day seven or day eight, what happens? They have symptom now. And if they get CT scan again, there is a flared symptom. And now there, since there is a scoring system, now they say, I had zero score at day one. How can I have nine score at day eight? So it is very diffi difficult for us to make them understand mm -hmm. this is the only way, this is the only the virus spreads. First the virus, you know, increases in quantity, re replicate and day 8 to 9, there is a symptom, flare symptom. So one should get CT scan done only at day 8 to day 10 if they are having worsening of symptom. If they are fine on day 8, day 10, they should not be any CT scan. Okay. That's very important because people are rushing to get it done, yeah. but they should wait. And how should you monitor your oxygen levels and what action should you take if you see your oxygen level dropping? So oxygen level is measured at home by pulse oximeter. And always try to put that in the middle of middle finger. And you should first, when you put in, press the button and you should wait for, hold for at least 10 seconds. Then only you see the oxygen level. What happens, the moment you put in, initially it doesn't take the exact oxygen level and it may show, you know, lesser ox oxygenation as you are actually having. So you should wait for some time and then finalize. The persistent level which is showing after 10 to 20 seconds is the actual level of the uh, oxygen level in the blood. Right, okay, that's very clear instructions. And if you see the oxygen level dropping, what action should you take? Yes, number one, uh, immediately everybody is not having oxygen concentrator and um, if it is less like if it is like 90 91 try to do self proning mm. means lie down in prone position for some time change your posture if 
you can do deep breathing exercises do deep breathing exercise and check it again if it is still around 90 or less than 90 immediately call your doctor okay so 90 is the threshold where you should start seeking medical yes. attention after uh, double checking and generally you know the oxygen doesn't drop like like in few seconds generally what we are seeing it is initially it was 98 then it is 96 then 94 then it is like gradual so patient can you know patient has time to understand in very very rare circumstances it can happen i'm not denying it but generally you have time right well dr richitha sharma thank you very very much for your time you've given very clear answers to the most important questions you've busted a lot of myths we're very very grateful to you for all your time and guidance here and also grateful to you and all your colleagues for all the incredible service you're doing on the front line, helping so many patients. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much.